Welcome everyone. My name is Stephanie Ivick. I'm the content marketing manager here at eLearning Brothers. We have a great session on accessibility for you today, but first a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded. We'll send a copy of the recording out via email to everyone who registered. As you've probably noticed, we have now switched to Zoom instead of GoToWebinar for these. This is really exciting because we can finally have live closed captions. So you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom window is a little button that says live transcript. You can click on that to enable the closed captions today. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to use the questions and answers panel. We'll get to as many as we can. If we can't get to your question, we'll do our best to follow up offline afterwards. There's also the live chat, so you can chat with other attendees throughout the session. And today we have Chris Paxton McMillan, president of D3 Training Solutions and trusted consultant of eLearning Brothers, Interactive Advantage, and U Achieve. Chris also volunteers with the Lectora Accessibility User Group, and she wrote the ebook that we'll be sharing content from today. We also have Dan Richards, VP of Professional Services at Interactive Advantage Corporation. Bill Milstead, Senior Developer from eLearning Brothers, and John Holland from our eLearning Brothers Customer Success Team. So we have a lot of experts here with you today. And without further ado, Bill, I will let you take over. All right, okay, so yeah, uh, welcome to our first Lectora Live for 2022. Um, it's good to have everybody here and good to have a, a great panel of guests. This is gonna be an important one, um, increasingly so both for our industry and then just for, for me personally. So I'm pretty excited to, to, that we're kicking the year off with this one. Like, like Stephanie said, it's going to be about accessibility. Um, but specifically, we're really looking at accessibility from kind of a beginner's lens, right? So if you're, if you're new to developing uh, with you know, 508 or, or WCAG concerns in mind, um, we're going to do our best to get you straightened out. Um, if you're a developer that's been around for a while, um, Hopefully, we'll have some time in there to answer questions to the experts, right? So if you have any kind of burning challenges you may need to uh, have resolved, we should have some time toward the end to, to get you get you straightened out as well. Um, and like I said, right, we, ha we, have, uh, we have got a couple um, experts here on the panel, um, so much so that uh, I'm, I'm going to be taking a back seat on this one and <laughs> letting them kind of drive. We're going to do this in, in a form of a, a Q&A, right? And ask a couple big questions about accessibility and Lectora specifically. Um, and throughout it, uh, we're going to be running through a, a new e-learning or e-learning guide to accessibility uh, ebook PDF that we have available for you. Um, Stephanie will have that out. Written by none other than the, one of the people we have here on the call, Chris. Um, so we're we're quite lucky to be able to 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 have her here. Before we get uh, really started into the meat of the webinar today, though, we're going to pop up a poll on the screen here. Um, see a couple questions. Uh, I ask these questions, similar questions, often at the beginning of Lectora Live um, because it gives me a really good feel for not only our, you know, immediate user group, but then over time, you know, to kind of feel for for how folks are using Lectora, how long they're using, etc. So, if you could just take a few seconds and answer these questions: How long you've been an e-learning developer? how long you've been learning using Lectora in general, and then how long you've been developing accessible learning. Um, take a few minutes for some answers to come in and then we'll see what our crew looks like. And then after that, we're just gonna get started talking. We've got, oh, it looks like almost everybody has answered. I'll give it just another minute. Uh, it's pretty split right now. Um, a lot of, a lot of kind of newbies and then a mix of people with different levels of experience. I'll give it just another second and then I will close the poll and show these results. Okay. All right, so you should be able to see the results there on your screen now. Okay, so we've got a lot of folks, the vast majority of folks have been, uh, you know, kind of in the, the one to three range for all three of those questions, right? So, so that means we've got a lot of, we've got a lot of growth that we can do here. That's great. Um, and hopefully that should also translate to some additional questions along the way, right? So while we're talking, feel free to just chime those in there, you know, 
whenever you have the question, don't wait till the end and, and either we'll interrupt and address it as, as needed, or like I said, we'll wait toward the end and then kind of pull them all together. Okay, so um, first thing, like I said, we have this wonderful uh, e-learning um, accessibility guide that we've just come up with. I think you can see my uh, screen there. There's actually a copy of the PDF that we're gonna get you for download. Um, we're gonna be looking through part of this today uh, to kind of guide where we're at. Um, but we're not going to go super in depth on it because there's just a lot in there. You can see it's 48 page document. If you look up at the top there, we really it's it's pretty exhaustive uh, in in terms of the content there. So um, when we're done with this, right, we're going to hit some kind of two big, big idea questions and then we're going to do some practical stuff. But when we're done this done with this, make sure you you'd go ahead and download it. Um, go through it in depth and follow the the kind of steps that we've outlined in there because it it's a spectacular resource for getting you up to speed with what you really have to be doing for 508 and accessibility in your e-learning courses just on its own all right so it's enough of my spiel um first thing i want to ask to to you know everybody on the call whoever wants to answer um is is really you know why accessibility like why why are we concerned about this right now? Why are we talking about this today? Um, what implications does it have for you as an e-learning author or your users for companies, right? Who who are, are engaging in training of their employees? Um, anybody who wants to take that, I'd love to hear it well defined because sometimes that's a that's a big question for developers. This is Dan. I'd be glad to take that one on. Let's go for it. You know. You think about uh, accessibility, and the first thing you may think about is Section 508 compliance, which, of course, applies to U.S. government agencies. And they're sort of mandated, unless they have a waiver, to create content that is accessible according to the law, the, the Section 508 law. What we see more and more of is that state and local agencies are also getting on that bandwagon, not because they have a specific mandate to do it, uh, and in some cases they do, it may be somewhat self-imposed, um, but for the same reasons that we see private sector uh, corporations and EDU uh, entities uh, getting into the accessibility world, and that's for diversity and inclusion uh, reasons, uh, and also for the number one motivator and the thing that we should all be trying to consider as we create this kind of uh, accessible content, which is because the content is important it serves a purpose or else we wouldn't be creating it. And we want everybody to be able to benefit by it and enjoy that purpose um, that the content was created for. So I think those are the things that really drive us. And depending on who you are, you may find that one or the other of the several standards and grades of standards that are out there are right for your organization. You know, just depending on what those objectives are, what are you trying to achieve? Um, who's in your audience and other factors? You know, what are the limitations that you're working within? So um, that's an important consideration is to understand those, uh, those standards and what they mean uh, to you and your organization as you select the right strategy uh, for accessibility. Christy, you, uh, would you kind of second that? Yeah. You got anything you'd like to add to that one? I, I would like to add a little bit. Um, over 10 years ago, I met a gentleman by the name of Christopher Westenhorf, I think, at one of the Lectoric Users conferences. And he said, and this, quote stuck with me he said people with disabilities are the largest minority in the world and it's the only minority group that we can join at any time and that has just stuck with me when we think of accessible design again we often think about those with visual hearing or physical impairments but we should also think about those age-related and situational or temporary impairments such as an accident where i normally say a broken arm or hearing or vision loss but bill you and i were just talking and you have a sprained wrist how does that affect a worker this kind of stuff happens that's a really good point right it is a it is a much broader audience than than we may immediately think of i know when i first started working with accessibility i didn't i didn't have those concerns i tell you right now it's pretty hard to type and use a tra use a trackpad or, or a mouse with, with you know a, a sprained hand so having some sort of an alternative in, in course navigation or you know, ability to, to move through this content is pretty critical right now even for things that you don't immediately think of yeah now, john did you want to jump in there i see you're off of mute or are you uh you pretty good with what we've covered. Yeah, I, I also just wanted to add that that 
when you design, as uh, Chris mentioned, when you design for accessibility and combine that with good usability, you also just start having the ability to include a lot more people that maybe you weren't targeting, but people who uh, maybe have to use and consume your content in a quiet environment or a noisy environment, so the captions help them. Or maybe someone is uh, not using the same language that you're using. So uh, some of the extra work you do uh, maybe appeals and brings them in and not that you would ever say that they have a disability, but um, combined with the usability, you really do get to include a lot of people in consuming your content. And that, that is what the goal of everyone has is to make sure our content gets consumed. Yeah. I think that's a great way to, to park it, right? Like um, accessibility is it's important because we, we want to make sure that this content that we're building, which we believe is important, is consumed as easily in the widest array of, of you know, possible I guess, environments and, and for, for different individuals. So um, if that's the case, right, we're talking about Lectora and accessibility today specifically. Right. And, and one of the things that we hang our hat on is that Lectora is a spectacular tool for developing accessible courses. Um, so, again, anybody who wants to jump in first, I'm, I'm fine with however we want to do it. Why is that? Why is it that we say Lectora is the industry standard, the leader for, you know, rapid authoring with accessibility focus? Anybody want to volunteer? Will I go first on that one again? Yeah, sure. Sounds okay. good. Well, I'll just start by saying we've, you know, we, our, our organization's been in business for about 24 years now, and we've used a number of different e-learning authoring tools. Just about everything significant that's come out onto the market, we've at least evaluated it and, and, and probably have used it in, in real uh, applications. And, um, you know, Lectora has always been a go-to tool for us, especially when accessibility is a factor. Part of the reason is it's um, it covers more of the requirements than anything that we've ever used. So when you know when we're talking about um, some of the deeper requirements for accessibility, and it has to be able to pass a rigid audit, a, a rigid test. Um, so for example, we have um, people who are DHS certified trusted testers on our staff, and they use a very rigorous testing. Um, process to validate any web-based content, including e-learning. And it's hard for just about any other tool out there on the market to pass all of those requirements. There's always something that holds them up, hangs them up, causes a problem, um, or, or more than just one thing. And it's not just something the developer can overcome and, and work around. Um, these are basic, basic things. But we find that Lectora is the thing that consistently helps us pass those tests first try. You know, if we've done our job as a developer and we follow the best practices for the tool, um, we're much more likely to pass that test. Um, and I'm, I'm not here to just uh, ring, ring the Lectora bell. I, you know, I, I think we're all here because we, we like using the tool, but that's an honest assessment of, of why we use the tool the way we do. Um, there are certain programmatic things that Lectora does under the hood that most developers are not ever even aware of things like how it will uh, tag buttons and um, certain field types and things like that, that the other tools simply haven't gotten there in their roadmap yet. They're coming to the game a little late. They, they may catch up eventually, but um, Lector has been there for quite a while and is still making enhancements to improve accessibility and make it even easier. So I guess that's one of the reasons, um, or it's the reason that we keep coming back to this tool um, when accessibility is a requirement. And uh, Chris or John, would you like to chime in with that or should we leave it on that one? That was a pretty good answer. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I, I think that that that's, yeah, I think, frankly, I think that pretty, pretty well sums it up. So we're just going to move on to actually doing stuff, right? So we're, we're here. You know, we we got to, okay, well, Lectora does some things that other tools don't. It makes, you know, some of this a little easier is what we're saying, right? Um, we've, we kind of understand why the need for 508 is there, but as we you know started out here most of us are beginners and, and need to learn how to actually to do something okay so um if i'm not completely mistaken and i don't think i am uh it's a, it's actually a pretty simple process really right the, the the practical steps it's a it's a big kind of a you know big idea but the actual practical steps that you have to take to get a course up to 
um, a, a decent level of accessibility, right, are pretty simple. Um, I'd like to walk through those now. And then Chris kind of volunteered to, to help me walk through those. Um, I'm going to share some pages of this uh, PDF, the, the ebook that we've got. And then we're also going to bounce into Lectora online and kind of show you some of that in the context of a course starter while we're at it. Okay. So um, all that being said, right, Chris, how do we, how do we actually get started? What's the, what are some of the key steps that we need to actually take to get a, a course up and going um, to a decent level of accessibility? I would definitely say one of the first things to do is to set your web accessibility settings and you can find that under the design tab and I want to preface though while this is a wonderful thing and it enables certain things for us in developing accessibility and it turns some things off that aren't accessible uh, it is not I don't know if the term is backward compatible you want to make sure that it's turned on as early as possible uh, because if you already created something, it's like, oh, wait, I've got to turn this on and you turn it on, it's not going to go back necessarily and say, hey, this doesn't work. So you're going to want to go ahead and, and check things. Uh, so that would be one of the first things uh, that I would recommend. And so you don't forget this. Uh, you'll hear me talk a lot about uh, when Dan and I do training and such uh, about templates. Create an accessible template and go back and reference that. So a lot of this stuff you won't necessarily have to remember each time. A great idea. Um, so, so there is a distinction, right, between a an accessible course and a non accessible course in Lectora. You have to manually enable that. Um, like I had the up on the screen there. We've we've got that pretty clearly mm -hmm. outlined in text. Um, that amount of text makes it seem a little more complicated than it even is in some ways, right? Because we've got to got to explain it. All you really got to do is you go to the design tab in Lectora Desktop or online. Doesn't really matter. You hit your project options, and it's just a checkbox right there, right? So got it highlighted, use web accessibility settings. And one of the things you'll see when you do that, right? If this document didn't have it turned on, and then I do, now we have this new little field underneath it for focus color, right? So what, what is that? Why do we need it? And uh, what do we do with it, I guess? Focus color, um, one of the things, if you're new with accessibility is first to understand, again, we talked about our visual, our hearing and our um, physical impairments. Different things work different ways. Most people automatically kind of think of JAWS, these screen readers or for assistive technology. And what that will do, there's a couple things I want to point out before we talk about that is when it automatically knows that in Lictor we have a text block, it's like magic and it automatically reads what's in the text. If there is a button or an image, Previously, I've seen people and they'll put the word button or image actually in the name and the software already knows it. It adds image or button to that. So that kind of takes care of that. But then we also have those, again, maybe with some physical uh, abilities and they're not using their mouse. They have to use their keyboard. And what this does is it actually shows that focus because they're just tabbing up uh, basically or down or hitting uh, shift controls. and when they press enter, it basically executes an action and it highlights what is there. And you can change that focus color. I think the default is a hot pink, maybe. Uh, I usually leave it the hot pink or change it to an orange. Um, Dan, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, this you're right. It's it's important. And in fact, um, I think it's Bill, you're, you're driving right now so we can see your screen. You mm -hmm. started pressing tab and we can see that focus rectangle showing mm -hmm. up around active elements. And that's really what we're talking about. The ability to move that visual focus rectangle uh, to any active element that we can then activate typically by, by pressing the enter key. And what's really neat about this, mo most people, when they think about setting up keyboard type functionality in an e-learning course, they start thinking, what custom stuff do I have to set up? How do I set it up so that they can press a special combination to go to the next page or do something like that? And what's really interesting is, is you, you don't really have to do that. Lectora has already kind of got that covered. All you have to do is sort of, as a user, press tab, bring that visual focus mm -hmm. rectangle to the active element that you would normally click, and then you would press enter. And we don't have to set up anything special in Lectora to facilitate that. It, it just happens. 
So yeah, I think this is a really critical feature. The ability to customize the, the look of it is, is really nice. Um, some browsers will honor that uh, better than others, but, um, but it is, it's nice to have that level of control. And it's kind of, it seems like this tiny little detail, right? And and that's, in my mind, is kind of true of just about everything we're going to talk about today is that most of this stuff, it's all just tiny little details that you need to be aware of and consider in your, your development and your output, right? Um, it's nice that it's just, it's right there. You just set a little, little option on it. Um, another tiny little detail that's in the same you know, project options is, is we've got this language drop down thing. Um, this one was confusing to me when I first came into accessibility, just, I just, okay, well, why do I need to set that? It's a, but because there's other languages in play, right? We're a global workforce. There's a lot of good reasons for this. Can you give kind of a, a quick overview of, of why we're setting languages in our courses, how that affects screeners, things like that? Sure. And again, think of when we're using assistive technology and our computers actually doing the reading for us. Our languages, it, this is basically the default, so it will read everything in the English language with the intelligence to put the accents where they need to be and pronunciations the way they should be. But let's say you're going along and you have a course and it's primarily in English, but then all of a sudden you have something, a section of some text that's in French or Ukrainian or there's all, there's I can't remember how many are in there. I counted at one point in time or found out from someone. Um, it will, instead of saying, reading that Spanish word with basically in English with that pronunciation, it will actually read it with the appropriate, um, appropriate tones. There we go. That makes sense. It's nice and simple. Um, <laughs> pretty clear explanation on that. So that's just kind of the basic, right? Uh, setup stuff. And then, I mean, theoretically, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to make a change to that, but it's it's right there for you in the tool and the project options. Right. It is pretty important to do if you're going to set up a course appropriately and it makes it nice and easy right there for you. So so let's let's move on to some more kind of practical bits, right? Because we talked about focus color. There's this other big deal. It's the thing that I've got highlighted on the page here that is uh, often quite mystifying for you. <laughs> New developers especially, and it's this concept of tab order. Now, this is sometimes, can, this is confusing to, to, to many developers, regardless of tool that we're talking about, but there are also some special considerations for Lector, right? So could one or more of you uh, give me kind of a quick rundown of tab order, why we're worried about it, and then the particularities of that in Lector? While you're doing that, I'm I'll go ahead and start and then... Dan or John can go further in it. When we think of tab order, I usually describe this as, because we're seeing from the top here, it's basically what is at that bottom layer. And, and we're all talking about layering here. And sometimes it's kind of hard to wrap your brain around it, but I describe it a couple different ways. Either that it is like you're making a pizza, you've got to have that bottom layer is going to be your pizza pan, or if you put the sauce on top of that, it's going to mess up your oven. So what is the bottommost layer on there? Well, that may be your welcome, or that may be your background. Another way to describe it would be a deck of cards. You know, we're laying them down. That first one, uh, let's scroll up there. You've got the header background. So that would be your first card that you laid down. Then the next card you laid down would be the course title text. Uh, and so forth. So that's that's kind of how I describe it. But I know Dan and John probably have much better descriptions. Either one of you want to toss your hat in the ring there and see what, see what we can come up with? Yeah, I, I think that's an uh, excellent description, Chris. Um, <laughs> I d would just add that the, the, the importance here is, and especially for newer Lectora users, we're talking about the, the ordering of items on the Project Explorer on the left side. And the, what you're seeing displayed on your page is on the right side. And so what the Project Explorer allows you to do is, regardless of when or how you put items onto the page, you use the Project Explorer to properly order them so that they will appear 
you know, you can, you can put the pan last on the page and the dough next, and then you can, you know, rearrange them in the way that makes sense by using the project explorer and, and the object will not move on the right hand side. So you're getting to control your mm -hmm. look. And then you're also able to create the ordering on the left side. And, and the importance of the ordering um, is that you, you want to make sure that uh, they are in the order that makes sense navigation wide and logically, because as we talk about other uh, assistive technologies like a screen reader, regardless of where the items are on the right side of the page, the screen reader is going to go through the items in the order they are in the project explorer. Yeah. And that's why that is very important that the project explorer order is logical and makes sense for you, for uh, what the customer should be processing the items in the correct order, regardless of where they may be physically on the page. And and kind of right physically on the page and the way that the the a screen reader processes um, our objects on the page are inverted, right, in a certain way. So one of the things that that is important to know about Lectora and Korea, you guys correct me if I'm wrong. Here, um, if you're familiar with like a Photoshop or, or, you know, any kind of graphic design or any tool, right? Any, the layering that you use in those tools, the topmost layer is always going to be your topmost visual object. Okay. In a project explorer, it's, it's opposite of that, right? So mm -hmm. we've got this objectives page highlighted on the left-hand side of the project explorer. You notice the first thing up at the very top of the pane is this skip nav button. Um, it's actually the bottom most object on, on the page. Okay, so visually, like the way I would interpret that between programs, that's kind of, it's counter to what I would initially think visually. But if you think about what our output is, you think about what John and Chris were just saying here, um, you know, this is, this is controlling the way a screen reader is going to see everything as well. So, um, you know, that stacking order becomes important. The things that are at the bottom of the page are gonna be technically read first and then upward in that stack, unless you change their order with a couple other overrides, right? So we've got this example on the right-hand side that shows you a bit of the project explorer. We've got this one, two, three, four, five, six, right? In a live example, the same one we had here, um, you can kind of see how that works, right? Objective one icon, versus objective one text. Um, go ahead, Chris. And I was just going to clarify, not just the screen readers, but also the tab order for those yes. that may be using the keyboard. So yeah, that, that's a fair point. Absolutely. Um, now, now, do, not everything has to actually be visible or read in a document, though, right? Um, we can very easily, quickly go in and, and turn off elements in a course if we so chose. Um, we've done that in here, um, there's a couple things that are turned off, right? So like all this stuff over to the left-hand side, um, we've gone in and we've tossed that an empty alt tag. Um, we, it, with templates and with custom development, we tend to do that with anything that's just, you know, non-narrative, anything that's decorative entirely. Can you give me, you know, is that is that the best possible way to do that? How should we be using um, kind of graphic elements or things that are, I guess, how should we be adjusting graphic elements or items that we don't necessarily want to, to display in that specific stacking order? Also, are there other ways that we can kind of adjust those beyond just an empty alt tag? Does that question make sense? Hopefully so. Anybody who wants to jump in? I guess in I that? can, yeah, this is Dan. I guess I can address that. You know, one, one consideration anytime you're thinking about this order, and you're thinking about that experience of someone, you know, experiencing the content with an assistive technology like a screen reader, we have to ask ourselves what's truly important about our content that they really need to know about. Uh, for example, in, in this case, <clears throat> there appears to be a background. And, um, you know, that background is a nice, a nice watermark. It looks really cool. But is it something that, that someone who's using a screen reader necessarily needs to have announced and described to them for them to truly understand and appreciate the concepts that are being introduced on the page instructionally? Pro probably not in that case. So the nice thing is Lector makes it easy for us to select those items and then using something like the empty alt tag uh, checkbox that you see here in properties, we can essentially have the screen readers ignore that. And indeed, this is not just a nice feature, it's kind of a requirement. When your content's being tested for accessibility compliance, it's, it's important, especially Section 508 compliance. It's really important that we not only appropriately describe those images and buttons and shapes, which we may talk about today, 
but also decide which ones don't need to be described. That's just as important and just as much a requirement. Oh, I wanted to elaborate on one thing uh, John said as well. He talked about the logical order that these readers read these items. And that's a little bit subjective. It's not always clear to folks, you know, whether one specific order is better than another specific order. Some people may say, well, I want it to read the items the way they appear on the screen from top left to bottom right, because that will be a logical order. And it, it, it is indeed logical. It may also be interesting to look at it from the usability perspective. You know, do we want to announce the next button before the back button, uh, for example, because the next button is the most likely used item after the content is consumed. So we have to be thinking about that logical order and the experience. And, and the, the best way to do that, in my opinion, is to actually experience it. You know, go ahead and hook up a screen reader, uh, let your content run, close your eyes and use the keyboard, navigate it and, and get a feel for that experience. Yeah, and, that, and that's right. That's free to do, right? Like there's, we can, you can get all kinds of very good standard screen readers for free. And if, you know, you're on a Mac and you can't get JAWS, right? There's Chrome extensions. There's, there's tons of options that you can, you can download, tie into your browser, launch a course and navigate through it so that you can get a better feel for, for what the course actually is. And, and like he's, like Dan just said, sometimes it's pretty eye opening. Um, if you haven't done it with your courses, you haven't gone through, you know, the process of setting up a 508 course, take one of them that isn't touched, run it through a screen reader, and then just get a feel for what, what we're doing to our users who are using screen readers it is it's not ideal um and then you know compare it right go in and take the steps that we're talking about now maximize your course set your course up appropriately hide things that are are non you know specific to content and then see how that changes your overall experience right um the, the kind of feeling you have when you're walking away from the course and your, your understanding of that content is almost guaranteed to improve pretty significantly with small changes um, now, since we were talking about order, I mean, as we talked about how it's important to order these, this seems like a tiny little point, but really all we're talking about is just dragging and dropping an object in that project explorer. I realize I probably should have said that, and I'm sorry if you guys already understand that as, as you know, the audience here, um, but, but that is a big deal, right? We're not talking about anything complicated to set this tabbing order. All we're talking about is just moving an object with a mouse to a different spot in that, that project explorer and then being conscious of, of where it falls. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Can we, oh. can we address an audience question really quick, just yes. to kind of recap? Um, the audience member wanted to confirm. So the screen reader starts with skip nav and then reads down the list until, so like objective four would be read last. Yes, that would be how it works. We start you the are very top blowing reader. minds and breaking hearts today. <laughs> I hope that's good. Um, well, we're actually, we're going to, we're going to do one right now that hopefully will, again, another really simple thing that just gets missed. We're going to talk about right now, uh, hopefully it'll blow some minds, both in terms of how easy it is to implement and how far it kind of gets you to helping out our users. Um, uh, but also maybe it'll illustrate something that folks just didn't even realize was a requirement or, or best practice here. And that is a, we've got this thing you'll notice was just addressed in the question there. We've got this skip nav thing sitting on the page there. And if you were to look at this document, what you'll see is that the first object in every single one of my pages is this thing called skip nav, okay? Um, now this is the best practice in setting up a 508 uh, compliant course. Um, maybe somebody who either wrote the book on it or uh, does a lot with it can, can give a, a good explanation of, of why and, and we need to do this. And then I'm gonna show you guys how we're implementing it after, after we get that answer. And I, I want to point out that it's not only best practice, but it actually is a requirement of 508 is that you have some type of skip navigation. And when you think about it, think about you hit a page and, and a lot of times you've got the logo in the top, you've got the title name, you've got your home help, all that stuff that those of us that are sighted users, we just kind of mentally kind of skip over and get to the content. Well, think about again, if you were using your tabbing to get uh, across, or if you were using a screen reader, it would read that each and every time. And think about how 
monotonous that would be and how frustrating it would be because you just want to get to the content and you're probably going to get frustrated and say forget this class which is not what we want them to do so with skip navigation there's several ways that you can do it and i we mention a couple different ways within the book uh, but has a best practice and sometimes it can be a little uh, controversial but we encourage people to use the html text types um, HTML has basically uh, levels H1 through H6, and this gives basically priority to your text type, not only within the course and the screen reader, but let's say you were publishing something to the web or search engine, it, it gives that priority. For a cited user, I like to think of it as that is your title, and that's how you, instead of just making your font a little bit larger, but you're also putting it in bold. That's kind of what these are doing. Um, and so you would go through and you could set up your skip nav in this particular example. Can you go back to share the example? Yeah. We've got uh, a couple different ways. So we've got our skip nav on each page. And this is one way of doing it because obviously as a template, you've got to try to do it where it hits as many people as possible. Yeah. So if you click on that text block that says skip nav and again i know it's a text block because it's that blue square with the white t in it if we look at the properties there we can see uh, that it says again current page go to the page title in that existing window well another thing if you notice at that page title so can you click on the page title properties mm -hmm page title properties. So you can see yes. how we chose those. We'll notice that again, we've adjusted. got our HTML type has that H1. So it knows automatically that even if we've got like that number one, this layout is ideal for using listing. If we're thinking top to bottom, left to right, that shouldn't be the first thing read. The first thing that should be read should be that page name. Yeah. So um, yeah, and like you were saying, right, like there's a couple different ways to do this. Um, mm -hmm. In a lot of courses, yeah. this object up top here may be your page name and maybe that changes on a page by page basis, right? If it's a global object, we just do a change contents mm -hmm. action and swap the page name out there. We don't set our templates up like that because we, we, we just don't know how users are gonna use them. So we kind of build them all individually and we expect maybe you're gonna put a different header on there. And there's all kinds of different stuff that we've got going on. So so in our case, right, we're just, we're adding it to the individual page, but this is something you sh kind of should and. Or, or could and probably should, depending on how you're building, do at a global level as well to make your courses more accessible, right? And, and like you just explained, it's a very simple process. Um, all we really have to do is we dump a text box in there, we put some descriptive text that explains what we're actually, you know, drawing our users to do there. Uh, and then we add a hyperlink, right? Um, uh -huh. Which points to a specific spot in your document. And a lot of times this is invisible to our sighted users because they will have that has zero opacity or they'll just make it the same color or put the layer behind something else because it's truly there again for that tabbing and for the screen reader. So if you ever go to a page, and I think Dan mentioned this once in a session, so I'll let him take it. You can actually sometimes see a skip nav on websites because this is something again that has to happen in websites too. G Google actually is a great example. I, if you're if you're tabbing through Google, there's a skip nav over on the left hand side that you may not realize is there at all. I found it because of because of this guy. So, you know, I, I was completely unaware. Um, it, yeah, it's this is this is there. It's remarkably easy to do. And the effect that this has in your course is pretty pronounced for users that are are, you know, having uh, uh, navigating in an alternative manner. Um, now, we so we mentioned these HTML types, right? Like we can assign that to everything in our course, right? So it's not, you should be assigning that to your skip nav and you should be assigning that to your page element, but we should also be paying attention to hierarchy throughout our course as well, right? Correct. Okay, so Correct. every object, let's say, you know, my page title here is my H1. I then, you know, semantically, I would assume my, my subhead is gonna be a, an H2 perhaps. And then maybe my content, as long as it's equally equal in, in you know, importance is probably all gonna be a, a standard P tag, right? Does that make sense? Correct. Okay, and we yes, can do does. that remark. I mean, the way that we do that is just, just a single drop down, right? We select the object, Correct. we choose what type it is, and then we move. Okay. Under the text properties contextual tab, yes. Wonderful. Okay, 
nice and simple. Um, so moving from that, we, we talked about tab order in general, and I kind of had hinted at it, but there are a couple other options, so a couple properties options that affect tab order um, and display a little bit, right? So there's the always on top option that we have, which changes the stacking order or something, and you can use that you know, to have something behind an object and read first, but display visually on top. And we also have the set reading order to last option. Does anybody want to kind of cover a little bit on that? Why we have it, why we would use it and, and when? Whoever wants to take it, if anybody. And if not, I can run. Okay, I guess I'll run with it. That's fine. Um, so like I was saying, we've got we've got a couple different options um, for how we can affect um, are, are both our tabbing order and our display order that don't directly correspond to where we've got everything positioned in the project explorer, right? Um, so for instance, you know, I've got these theme elements here, which are technically at the very bottom of my, my you know, project explorer visually, right? They're behind every single thing else, but I've got them set to always on top. So as a screen reader comes through and hits my course, anything that's, you know, in this group that is not hidden with an empty alt tag, like for instance, this course title text, um, it's going to be read kind of first because it's the very top level thing, but it's going to display way up at the, the front end. So it's going to really look as though it's, it's all the way at the bottom of this stack here. Um, there are elements that that may be global right that you you need to have kind of at that top level of your project explorer but you don't want them to be read first right so like in that header case it makes perfect sense to have my page title be read first it's my page title or my course title i want that to be first right um but things like a navigation right which contextually should be after you consume all of the content on your page you kind of, you know, you need you need that to, to flow last. We're usually going to set that up in a global fashion, though, in Lectora, which means that in the Project Explorer, it's going to be stacked all the way up at the top and therefore read first. But we have this nice little set reading order to last checkbox there, which we could just immediately override that, grab your, your navigation group, set it to last, and then that kind of changes the way that screen readers process through that information. Tiny little change fits into your workflow and just takes care of a ton of problems. So that's that's one little thing to be aware of as you're going through this as well. Um, so we're, we're not going to get into table of contents and drop down or fly out menus here. Um, there's a lot. <laughs> we're also at 43 minutes already. We could probably spend an hour just on figuring this out and how to make it work right, right? Uh, but I do want to talk about color contrast and then some other things as they relate to what we do for you over here. OK, um, color contrast is super important for what we're talking about here um, there. Right. We, we need to make sure that there is a sufficient degree of contrast between all text and all colors in our document, in our course. Um, there are a couple different, you know, tools that can help you with this. There's a, there's a bunch of them out there. I just pulled up this color.adobe.com because it's just a nice, I use it frequently because I'm doing design work. So I'm, I'm in there anyway, but it's got a nice user interface and it can also give you some suggestions. But the basic idea is whenever you're creating a course that has text on, drop, uh, on a background, right? So if I were to go back to my course here, take a look at what we've got on the objectives page here. We've got this black and yellow text on a white background. Well, I need to make sure that that text stands out from that background sufficiently. I mean, in order to do it, I, I, I just go in and I grab my color value, figure out what that is, and I can plug that into one of these color checkers, right? So I know what my text is. Um, scroll. And I know what my background color is, right? So in this case, Black on white. Well, clearly there's enough contrast there. We got a 21 to one ratio that'll cover for every single thing. But that's not always the the, the case, right? Um, sometimes we we may find ourselves in in a position where uh, we just have some issues in our course um, where we've got some limited uh, contrast between those text elements. It's a really good idea to pay attention to that as much as possible because you're going to create issues for your users if you don't check this stuff. Go out confirm, make sure you're good with your branded colors and your text and your background stuff and all that through an online tool. We do that um, for you. 
in a lot of our, our in all of our, our course starter templates and all of our standalone templates. Um, we've got kind of, we've got a, a list of, of what we actually do. We, we go through double A and we check off a, a pretty exhaustive uh, list of concerns for, for 508 here um, in our templates. And, and we kind of get you, you know, on, on the way to, you know, 80, 90% of there for a course. But this is a critical thing to check and it's often overlooked. This also applies to icons if you're going to be using those in any sort of a meaningful way, especially with navigation. So um, be very careful about this. It's very easy to do. People miss it. I see it all the time that it just doesn't get done or doesn't get checked. And it's probably the easiest thing of, of all that we've talked about here to actually implement because you can, you do this in every title, right? It's a best practice regardless of whether or not you're on a 508 course or not. So Chris, I see you just... Yes, I just want to point out a couple of things that can make your life so much easier. And I think it came about in 19 or 21 is with Lectora, you now also have the ability. So once you've tested those colors to make sure your contrast is there, you have the ability to go in and save those colors in a color palette. And I don't know that everybody, I think that's one of those tools that not everybody is aware of. So in addition to, of course, creating your templates, you can go in and you'll see at the top there, it's save color. So you could actually save that in there. So you always know, well, what exactly blue was it? Because again, your shades could be a little bit off, but definitely go through and test your approved colors from your marketing department. Maybe also put those into some type of style guide. That's a great idea. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, we're, like I said, we're already running out of time here. There's, there's a couple more things we could cover in the accessibility book. Um, but truth be told, I mean, I think we've covered a, a lot of, of what you actually have to do to get started in here. And again, it's all very simple, very just detail oriented stuff, just a way of thinking about your, your course here. Right. Um, so I don't want to push it further and then, and you know, let's go down a rabbit hole that's, that's going to keep us here over two o'clock. So so maybe uh, let's take a pause and see if there are any questions that need to be addressed. Um, you know, if anybody's got anything that they'd like us to, to take a look at specifically. And if not, um, we'll kind of start wrapping up and point you to this this PDF and, and get it over to you so you can start uh, putting it into action in your own courses. All right, Seven. Bill, we, we don't have any questions right now. Um, you right. guys have been doing such a great job of explaining it. We do have some praise for you that this is really important. Um, it's going to be super useful to people who have new developers on their team. So that is great. You guys are doing amazing. And the link to the ebook is in the chat. Um, getting some feedback. It's it's being a little wonky depending on your browser. So I will also put the ebook link in the follow-up email with the recording. And it's also available on our website from the ebooks page. So there's lots of ways to get it. If none of those work for you, you can email me. My email is in the confirmation email you get from Zoom and I will send it to you directly. Sounds great. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Then I think, I think we'll, uh, oh, Chris. You go for it before Actually, I, I have one little plug I want to make sure I add uh, to you guys. And uh, hopefully you guys are all Lectora users and you all have an interest, obviously, in accessibility. Uh, we have what is referred to the Lectora Accessibility User Group. And it is a free group that meets uh, approximately during the lunch hour. We're central time here. Uh, Christine O'Malley, who again co-authored the book, uh, is the uh, creator and runs the group. Uh, our next, uh, but it's basically the last Thursday of the month, January through October. Uh, in addition to that, there are some 508 classes on how to work 508 and work with 508. And Dan, I'll let you talk about that one. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we've been teaching a class on accessibility with Lectora since version 17. And uh, if you're interested in learning about that class, you can find it on the eLearning Brothers site amongst their many classes. And I uh, highly encourage it uh, for those of you who are just kind of getting into it and want another, you know, uh, a little bit deeper, but still very practical dive into um, actually making something that, that that's accessible by the time you're done with that class. It's a really nice hands-on experience um, that I think you'll find really useful. Thanks. Thanks. That's perfect. That's a perfect way to end it. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to add anything. I'll say thank you uh, from us on our team and from everybody else who's on mute here for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. Good luck with your accessibility courses. Stephanie, over to you.
All right. Well, I mean, that was the perfect closing. I have nothing more to add other than if you don't have Lectura yet, you can get a free trial on our website. And I'll be sending the recording and the ebook. And I'll add the link to the Lectura Accessibility Users Group and those training courses. I'll put those all in the email too. So everybody has all the resources. Thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to see you on our next webinar. Thank you.